an academic part with over 30 talks by academics and industry experts. And day two, uh, Thursday, we'll host uh, five practical workshops on editing, revision, post-editing, trans-creation, vi video game localization and CAD tools, uh, which uh, will be run by experts from Poland's top translation agencies, get it in Venire, uh, Lion Bridge, and Mart. Um, and now, I would like to pass the floor to uh, Professor Małgorzata Tryuk uh, for the opening address, uh, who, will, uh, 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 who is our distinguished professor of translation and interpreting studies and the head of interpreting and audiovisual translation department. She is a coordinator of our ENT, MC and SUTI presence. Professor Tryuk offered many books and papers on ethics uh, in interpreting, terminology as well as translator and interpreter training. She will uh, deliver a talk on uh, overviewing the history of translator training uh, in Poland with special focus on our institution because we were the first in Poland. presentation. <laughs> Uh, good morning. Hello, everybody. Uh, distinguished uh, professors, organizers, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as I am one of the oldest professors in our institute, the organizers asked me to present the beginning of the training in this profession. I'm just quite a dinosaur. And as such, I have a quite long memory. <laughs> uh, and talking about the beginning of um, translators and interpreters training in Poland, uh, I must, I'm obliged uh, to begin with the name of a very important figure uh, in translation studies in Poland. It means with uh, Olgier uh, Adrian Wojtasiewicz. Uh, very famous, but in Poland, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, lawyer, linguist, scientologist, translator, and scholar, who 61 years ago published a very small book, yet very, very important for our uh, discipline, called in Polish, Wstęp do teorii tłumaczenia, it means the introduction to the theory of translation. But as my presentation is um, devoted to the training, uh, of translators and interpreters, I will not investigate the main uh, achievements of uh, Wojtasiewicz's contribution to translation studies. Uh, I will concentrate on his major accomplishment, it means the foundation of the first academic institution of training translators and interpreters in Poland. So, as in many other European countries, in Switzerland for ET now, FTI, or in EZIT in Paris, or in Prague at the same moment, uh, the launching of a training program followed exactly the same scheme. First, there were self-made translators and interpreters who decided one day to transmit the experience, uh, very large experiences, to other generation decided to uh, and decided to organize a sort of training uh, in a specific structure within the academia. Uh, and then afterwards, hmm, self-made translators and interpreters became trainers. And becoming trainers, they had the thought to write down what, they, what their thoughts were. And they became researchers. Uh, and to look, for example, for norms or rules in translation. There was also a separate structure, very important, but I will not talk about this today. Self-made translators and interpreters decided to launch professional organization. And at the same time, they, their achievement was the same because they 
discovered norms in translation. Uh, so this was exactly the same. At our university, the training, so then and now, uh, I can divide it in two different stages. The stage one, only training, and it was the school I'm going to talk about in just uh, half a minute. And stage two, training followed by the research. It means the academization of the, uh, uh, of the discipline. And this is what is happening now in our Institute for Applied Linguistics in different sub-stages, as you can see. But I will not have time to discuss it. So, this is Olgert Adrian Wojtasiewicz's books. The first edition, 57, as you can see, I suppose. Uh, mm, uh, Olgert Wojtasiewicz was a polyglot. He was a uh, graduate from Oriental Studies in 38, before the war. And during the war, he learned English. He was a translator after the war from Chinese literature into Polish and English or an American, British and American literature into Polish and from Polish into uh, English. But uh, uh, he translated most, mostly philosophers, mathematicians, logicians from Poland into English. He wrote Stem Dotori Tłumaczenia and he was also a translator and interpreter trainer. Uh, together with a group of uh, other translators, as Leon Teroganian, himself a polyglot, a translator and a trainer, he decided to uh, create Wyższe Studium Języków Obcych. I wrote it, the School of Translators, it was the name of this, of this place. Wyższe Studium Języków Obcych, in English, High School of Foreign Languages, which uh, operated in these years at different addresses. Uh, some lessons were took at the Faculty of Geology and some others in a school nearby uh, uh, in the street uh, Wawelska. And then it was moved to <laughs> Browarna Street. I will show you some photographs of this Browarna. It does not exist anymore, but it, it is just round the corner. So perhaps some of, of you remember. Uh, studied there, because I studied there. So this is, this is Wojciotą, uh, the high school, and afterwards, after 73, the Institute of Applied Linguistics. Uh, another photograph, this is the entrance hall, and the very famous entrance halls, no, this is, this is a very important entrance hall. We, we don't have any in this building, as you know. And this is uh, another picture, and this is the old and the new. The old and the new. Nostalgia, huh? isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, uh, from... Uh, mm, so... Uh, uh, and after 73, uh, um, uh, this uh, high school changed its name, becoming the Institute of Applied Linguistics, which became the center of uh, both training and research in translation and interpreting, with a completely new structure, with a distinct, di distinct diploma of MA in, uh, in Applied Linguistics, it means in foreign language teaching and translation and interpreting. And this new idea, uh, of an uh, uh, absolutely new academic institution was conceived uh, by a duo of professors, by Professor Franciszek Grucza and together with Professor uh, Barbara Keller. I will talk about her uh, in, a, in a moment. Uh, the very, very first Polish scholar in translation studies, as he wrote, the first PhD in translation studies in, in Poland. In, 60, uh, 67. So, who are the candidates to this high school? Uh, uh, bilinguals or trilinguals. Uh, uh, we had a very, very difficult entrance exam, written and oral, in three languages, 
Polish was a language. And uh, four languages, we had to choose two of them, among English, German, French, and Russian. And I added Spanish because some of the candidates, after passing the exam in Russian, decided to choose and to learn Spanish. And they continued in with Spanish. Uh, so it was the, the Spanish. And this is, this is the original program of this, of this school. I have one exemplar. <laughs> Very precious, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> um, and what were the major characteristics of this program? Uh, um, it was a pioneering institution, and the, uh, the characteristics were really multiple. It was the first academic institution, uh, and uh, its origin was uh, a very uh, demanding uh, market, uh, very growing market demand for professionals, and an interest among young uh, uh, candidates. Uh, I made some interviews among former students of the WVSGO students, and they all t t uh, told me that they were interested, first of all, by languages. They had no idea of the, of the profession they could learn after two years. But they were first interested by a very, very good school in languages, in more than one language. And this was what uh, attracted them uh, mostly. The curriculum, as you can see, was revolutionary for, for that time. Uh, uh, there were, uh, as you can see, a lot of hours of foreign languages. B, it was called the first and second language. During the first two years, they have lessons of languages, different kind of lessons, phonetics, grammar, stylistics, and so on, and so on, but also uh, literature uh, and civilization. And then years three and four were devoted to translation and interpreting. And they were separate. They were separate. like this. Everything was written down. And of course there was a, a, large, a large part of uh, the, the, the political bloc. International law, economics, political causes, but it was for the time being quite, quite uh, usual. And there was typewriting. There, there, there was typewriting no computers at that time, so typewriting, not shorthand, but typewriting for the students. And what was, um, uh, what was interesting, that there was uh, uh, an additional one hour of typewriting for the students in Russian, <laughs> telling that uh, it is more difficult to, try to, to write in, in Russian. And one more lesson of Latin, there was, we, we learned Latin, for the French group because we have some connection with uh, French and Latin. So the, this is uh, quite interesting. There were separate, can I continue? Yeah. There were separate, uh, separate uh, textbooks, especially written for this school. And I brought uh, something very interesting. I, I, I found it uh, uh, this morning at, at home. Uh, it is uh, written by Jerzy Pienkos. And it is called uh, Organisation Internationale. It is the original textbook of 67 uh, with the description of any kind of organization of that time with uh, the half of it. It is a list of, of terms, terminology. Very interesting. You can learn everything from this. It's, it's like a dictionary. And another, uh, another uh, uh, textbook by Antoni Platkov, Analyse schimographique des sons du langage, 70. And it is written 
by vicious to be music of optics. So uh, it was it was written especially for, for this particular cause and not not the other. Yes, one minute, one minute. So this is my diploma huh? with the, <laughs> no with the the signature of Wojtasiewicz. Huh? He was the dean and the trainers. The trainers, Jerzy Lisowski, a famous literary tr translator, Jerzy Pienkos, a lawyer and the f one of the first biggest lexicographer in Poland, Halina Dzierżanowska, who was herself a translator and a translator trainer, and of course Barbara Kielar, which I mentioned before. Uh, she wrote in 69 the first PhD thesis in translation studies called the English equivalence of Polish terms in uh, constitutional law. Uh, uh, and it was written under the supervision of Wojtasiewicz and of course Andrzej Kopczyński, interpreter and one of the first interpreter studies scholar in Poland. And just to finish, because I have one minute, I would like to mention for this period of 10 years, three graduates, very, I think, well-known graduates of this school. Małgorzata Łukasiewicz, she was a literary translator. Uh, she received many accolades and she's really extremely uh, well-known translator in Poland. There is Wojciech Gilewski. I don't see him, but he promised me to come. Uh, uh, he is a literary translator, legal translator, and interpreter, and conference interpreter. So many, many, uh, many disciplines in one. And Jerzy Ogonowski, who is a legal translator and interpreter uh, at the same time uh, from Wrocław, I, I suppose. And then another era uh, began, and this is another. Uh, story. <laughs> I have to, to stop. Thank you. Professor Chu, thank you so much for this uh, excellent introduction uh, and setting the scene to our conference. Now we'll move to uh, our keynote speakers. We will have a slight uh, modification of the program. Um, now we'll have a talk by Joss Murkens, then we'll have a talk by Mark Shuttleworth, and after the coffee break we'll have uh, Lucas Nunes Vieira, who is flying right now because of the uh, air controller uh, strike in France uh, yesterday. His connecting flight was, he, he was not able to uh, catch his connecting flight. Okay, so now I would like to invite uh, Joss Murkens and Mark Shuttleworth. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you so much for uh, coming to also. Uh, Joss Milkens is an assistant professor at the School of Applied Language and Intercultural Studies at Dublin City University and a researcher affiliated with the ADEPT Center and the Center for Translation and Textual Studies. He has authored numerous journal articles and book chapters on translation technology, post editing of machine translation, user evaluation of machine translation, translator precarity, and translation technology standards. He co-edited the book Translation Quality Assessment from Principles to Practice, which will be published in, uh, by Springer in 2018. The floor is yours. Thanks very much, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Lucia Beale and the organizing committee for asking us to, to come here um, and to, uh, to the, the European Commission field office and Christoph for, for inviting us and organizing. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about translators and neural machine translation today. Um, in the context of the changing profile of the translation profession, um, now to see if my little clicker is working. No. Oh, it is. How magic. <laughs> the technology works. Um, so uh, yes, and, uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the changing profile of the, the translation profession. Um, I'll report on the quality evaluation of neural machine translation that I was involved with as part of a European project uh, and my efforts to replicate that with some undergraduate students. 
Um, then a little bit about new use cases for NMT. Um, I understand that after the break that Lucas will be speaking about change readiness in the industry and Mark Shuttleworth will be talking about translation technology teaching. So hopefully all of our, our talks will be complimentary. So by any measures, um, it seems to me that translation has never had it so good. We've got more translators in employment than ever before, although, as you can see, the, the estimates are wildly varying. Um, but by any measure, the, the number is large and it's growing. There's an explosion of digital content, which means that there, there's more material to translate uh, using a, wi a wider variety of tools than was previously available. Uh, the US Bureau of Labor Statistics has estimated that in America there'll be a, an increase, uh, a required increase of roughly 18% in employment and translation and interpreting. So that equates to about 12,000 people. And that's downgraded from their estimate of 2014 of a 29% increase, but still quite sizable. Um, and uh, the University of California in San Diego has uh, listed translation and interpreting as the top emerging career for 2018. Common Sense Advisory estimates continued 5 to 6% growth year on year in the language service industry, which is worth about $40 billion annually. But then machine translation is also doing better than ever. So this is a, a, a screenshot from the Google I.O. conference in 2016, where they said that Google Translate was translating at the time 143 billion words per year. And then there are lots of other uh, MT providers that provide MT for assimilation, i.e. GIST translation, um, or for dissemination, where translators use MT as a productivity tool, most usually uh, involving post-editing, which is an acti activity that relatively few of them enjoy. But back to those incoming translators. What will their jobs look like? So the vendor model for translation means that, according to many surveys, roughly 70 to 80% of translators work on a freelance basis. Um, you can see here that uh, there have been studies done by Common Sense Advisory, uh, Maureen Ehrensberger Dow and her group in Zurich, uh, one that myself and Sharon O'Brien did, and one from last year that was a, a collaboration between the uh, Charters Institute of Linguists, the ITI in the UK, and the DGT. Um, so this rate is higher than the general population for freelance or contingent work. Um, if we look at the general population in the US, people on freelance or contingent contracts equate to roughly 40.4% of the workforce. This was as of 2010. So that means that roughly 59.6% of uh, US workers work on a permanent uh, stable basis. And it's roughly the same in the, e in the EU. So in the EU 28, as of 2014, it was estimated that full-time permanent employment averaged around 59%, although as you can see with the little arrow, that number is dropping. And looking country by country, uh, my own country, Ireland, is right on average, with this, it's roughly 59% um, full-time permanent work. In Poland, a little less, 58, 57%. But um, back to looking at a, a translation, the rate of, of freelance translation is likely to grow. And even the DGT, which is one of the largest translation services, as we all know, plans to cut permanent employment um, and increase outsourcing from 25 to 40 percent over the coming years. Now, um, Guy Standing in SOAS in London has written a lot about precarious work, and he has noted that there's nothing intrinsically bad about work that involves multiple statuses, multiple activities, and uh, various intensities of involvement in different forms of work. Um, and Natalie Kelly from Common Sense Advisory has noted that uh, for, employ for the employers, uh, the freelance model is flexible, scalable, cost-effective, and uh, it's good to re for responding to market demands. For freelancers, they might gain autonomy that they mightn't enjoy otherwise when working for a language service provider, where career progression might entail a move away from translation into administration or into management. And uh, there appears to be, from our surveys, uh, a relationship between age and employment status. So a survey that we carried out in 2014, we found that uh, younger translators are more likely to work directly for a company, whereas translators over the age of 30 are more likely to work on a freelance basis. And uh, that rate increases as, as uh, we go through, the, the, go through the, the age ranges further on. And these younger translators are also more likely to feel positively about translation technology. 
and machine translation. And this is important as their roles are, are likely to be highly technologized, uh, as productivity is key, particularly for specialized translators. So as Don Corrali wrote, where translators were once linguistic hermits, sitting alone behind a typewriter, or in St. Jerome's case, behind a piece of paper, uh, surrounded only by dusty tomes, they're now embedded in a complex network of social and professional activity. So as Schaffner and Dimitri Dimitriou noted, uh, globalization has brought about an enormous increase in the need to have information translated. Uh, MT is increasingly used as a productivity tool, and according to this work from Common Sense Advisory from 2016, over 80% of European LSPs surveyed stated that they offer post-edited MT as a service, whether they, they work on the MT systems in-house or outsource them to a different MT provider. Various surveys that we've carried out have shown an association between M attitudes to MT and tra translator experience, with experienced translators less likely to want to work with machine translation, and an association between employment status and machine translation. So I'm going to try and illustrate this with results of a survey that I carried out in 2016 of accredited Irish-English translators. We don't have that many accredited Irish-English translators. There's only 178 of them. And, but of those, 95 responded to my survey. There's 34 who work on a freelance basis, eight with a single agency, which is particularly precarious. 17 participants work as public servants. Uh, 12 are self-employed. And you can, as you can see here, the younger participants are more likely to have a translation qualification. Um, this inevitably is due to the, the fact that translation qualifications weren't so prevalent uh, in years, in, uh, in previous years. We don't have a, a program that's been running as long as Professor Tukes. Um, and uh, we also, we, yeah, so we found that the, the, um, the results demonstrated the difference between the Irish public service and freelance translators. So the, the public service translators they tend to be more well disposed towards technology and the requirement to continually upskill. They consider that machine translation will allow us to make better use of the small pool of Irish language translators with the caveat that it might cause dilution of language variety and quality. So their worries are more to do with language. They feel quite secure, secure in their employment and they aren't really afraid of what technology might bring. Whereas with uh, the freelance participants, many of them feel quite disempowered in their career not all, and are worried about incoming technology. They're worried about the potential for MT to replace human translators, their powerlessness with regard to human translations being repurposed as training data for machine translation engines. And the disparity morale was apparent in uh, some Likert type uh, questions that I put to them, some statements. So their, their responses to, to positive and negative statements, we can see the, the differences here. So in terms of positive and negative statements, there's a, a discrepancy between freelance and public servant employees and uh, response to negative statements. For example, responding to my work has a strong purpose. We see a lower average score for freelancers. Um, and it was a similar story for statements about payment terms, about job security, about fair compensation at work. You can see there's quite a difference here, an average of 4.08 for public servants and company employees, whereas it's 3.11 for freelancers. Some of the responses from freelancers to a statement about isolation at work were actually quite alarming. Um, one said that she'd been actively moving out of the career for some time now, and another said that the, the isolation of self-employed working from home was literally killing me, as was repetitive strain injury. Uh, and stress related to tight deadlines in the cutthroat market. Although responses from freelancers weren't all gloomy. One said that the, the nature of translations is changing and evolving, so too are documents and cat tools. The grammar itself takes many years to learn and translation is a good way to enforce what's been learned. There'll be a bright future in Ireland for Irish translation. I've had to increase my turnaround continuously since, since 2010 and it's no, showing no signs of decreasing. And there are quite a number of, of freelancers, uh, bloggers, um, and other people who've spoken to us and said that they, they quite like freelancing, the transactional nature of their relationships. It works for them, and they're struggling to keep up with demand. So when we looked at what um, freelance participants considered to be threats to the translation profession, some cited a race to the bottom in terms of unit rate and quality. Another spoke about agencies aggressively lowering rates and winning huge contracts so that they can corner the market and pressure translators into accepting ridiculous rates. 
But more worryingly for us was uh, one participant that said that increasing improvements in MT will in eventually reduce the role of the translator to that of editor, proofreader, and another said, I don't see much of a future for human translators. And much of the media discourse around translation these days, it encourages this sort of negative thinking. If we look back to contemporary newspaper reports from 1954, around the time of the, the IBM Georgetown experiment, we can see um, this report of the, uh, the electronic translating brain being the latest miracle, how uh, in a very short space of time this, uh, this miracle machine will be able to translate a number of books in just the space of a few minutes or an hour, and there'll be no need for human translators quite soon. And that same sort of language has been in use recently to do with neural machine translation. So if we look at these uh, headlines from 2016, Google Translate update makes it pretty much as good as a human translator. Google's AI translation system is approaching human level accuracy. There's the word miracle again. Newest GNMT time to witness the miracle of Google Translate. There have been blog posts like this one from Taus, from Yap van der Meer, the future does not need translators various uh, newspaper articles that come out every so often. Here's an example from The Guardian in the UK. Tech is removing language barriers, but will jobs be lost in translation? And this is part of a, a more general discourse about AI and, uh, and employment and displa displacement of, of employment. Like this article from Elon Musk, humans must merge with machines or become irrelevant in the AI age. And uh, just recently, in March of this year, there was this, uh, this announcement of a major milestone, Microsoft creating a, mi a machine translation system that translates a test set of news articles from Chinese to English as accurately as a human. Um, of course, within the paper itself, there were some caveats, but that isn't what the headline writers see. Um, and this, uh, the, the article itself was actually uh, the head author, the lead author of this article was Dr. Hani Hassan, a graduate of, of my university. And it was responded to by his PhD supervisor, Andy Wei, my colleague, who said, I've been in the MT field for 30 years now and have spent most of that time trying to appease translators who think that we're all out to get them. What we're really trying to do is make technology enhanced translators even better, faster, etc. They see headlines like this and think they're going to be out of a job soon, which is not going to happen. I've spoken at quite a few events recently which try to show translators that they have little to fear from MT. Um, and here's a, 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 rather, um, a, a rather unscientific graph from Philip Kuhn from a presentation for Omniscient Technologies where uh, he shows the, the hype from the Georgetown experiment in 1954 and he reckons that neural MT is the first time that machine translation hype has surpassed that and compares that with the, a graph of reality. So the quality, the level of quality we can expect from machine translation is increasing, but not quite to the extent that the hyperbole might say. So what is the state of the art for machine translation? Um, well, judging by um, the competitive shared task that is carried out every year in the WMT competition, um, this is looking at the English to German translation task using uh, news test data. So a news test is, is a data set of, of news articles, um, magazine articles, um, and the evaluation is done using the uh, Bleu automatic evaluation metric. So looking at phrase-based SMT, the results have been um, fairly consistent. These are the top performing systems year on year from 2013. If we look at syntax-based uh, statistical machine translation, the, we, we can see there was a slight jump in blur points around 2014-15. But uh, after, from 2016 on, there's been a jump once neural machine translation was introduced, a jump of two and a half blur points, and that was replicated the following year in 2017. So um, whereas SMT is a tra has a, a translation model that predicts the most likely translation, and a language model that predicts the, pro uh, the probability of seeing that target segment in the target language, plus many small subcomponents that are tuned separately. For NMT, engineers create a single large neural network that reads a sentence and outputs a correct translation. So that single large neural network is able to deal with a, a stable segment length. Um, so to deal with variable segment length, uh, a recurrent neural network is added. And uh, the NMT system then predicts a target word based on the context associated with the source and the previously generated target words. Words are produced one by one. 
a small neural network called an attention mechanism analyzes content for every source word, creating a sort of word cloud. So since about 2015, it's been identified that the strength of NMT is grammatical improvements, but there's possible degradation of lexical transfer, and that's uh, something that we've found. And some further problems are that it's computationally expensive. So there was a paper from 2017 by uh, some Google engineers, and they were trying to find out or, or investigate different ways of translation, translating English-German data using NM NMT systems. Um, and it's computationally expensive because it uses expensive graphical processing units. They used roughly 250,000 GPU hours, which equates to about 75,000 kilowatt hours. So in our homes, if we were to use that much power, it would cost, it would cost me about 12,000 euro, or about, I think it's about 50,000 zloty, I think is the com conversion rate. So it's, it's quite expensive. Networks have a fixed vocabulary. So there's poor translation of rare or unknown words. One of the ways that, um, that engineers have tried to deal with this is by splitting words into smaller chunks. This is a technique that's borrowed from um, automatic speech recognition known as byte pair encoding. There's poor domain adaptation within the Tramook project that I worked on with Wilhelmina Sassoni here. Um, we, uh, we tried to, well, or rather the uh, MT engineers tried um, using general data for the first portion of training and then swapping that out at a certain stage and then swapping in domain-specific data. But there's no established technique for domain adaptation as yet for NMT. Some people have identified problems with long sentences. Um, a paper by Antonio Toral and Groningen and some others um, found that for very long sentences they were finding um, that quality decreased. Models are trained on parallel data, so how do we use the monolingual data that was very valuable for statistical machine translation training? And at the moment, the state of the art here is to actually back translate this target text monolingual data using an SMT system and then create this parallel data set and train using it. It's also difficult to incorporate terminology, and there's various people working on, on ways to incorporate terminology in a consistent way within NMT systems. So I mentioned previously um, the comparative study that, that, uh, that created all the hype from Google, this um, bridging the gap between human and machine translation. The study that myself and indeed Villa Amini were involved with is this one, comparative evaluation of PBSMT and NMT um, with, my, uh, some, with some colleagues in DCU and in other universities as part of the Tramook project. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that now. In previous studies, like this one by Luisa Bentevogli and others from Rome and from FPK, they found that NMT outperformed all other approaches. This study used English-German, um, and they found that post-editing effort was lower on all sentence lengths. There were fewer morphology, lexical, and word order errors, and a great improvement in the placement of verbs. That Google paper that I mentioned, again, showed that NMT strongly outperformed all other approaches, although they didn't have anyone post-edit. This was automatic evaluation and just ranking of, uh, of segments. Within our evaluation, we used four data sets of 250 segments from real English language MOOC data, <clears throat> so from massive open online courses. It was translated into German, Greek, Portuguese, and Russian using our, our own Tramook engines built by the University of Edinburgh. We mixed up the, the empty outputs, randomized task order, and had two to four professional translators working in each of the language pairs. The empty engines were trained on the same openly available general data, uh, such as the, the, the data found on the Opus website. And then we used educational data that came from our MOOC provider, Iversity, from Coursera, Qatar Educational Domain, EU Teachers Corner. And then to, for our evaluation, for the assessment of quality, we looked at the comparative ranking of 100 randomized translation segments. We uh, had, we had uh, translators post-edit uh, using the PET tool. So we looked at temporal effort, the time spent post-editing, technical effort, the edit count. We had them uh, rate fluency and adequacy, and then do a rather simple error annotation. So looking side by side, we can see that there's a preference for all language pairs for NMT output especially notable for English to German. Um, and this, this held true for all of the different text types. We had um, texts about physics, we had one about uh, medical training, we had another one about um, analysis of advertisements. Uh, we had some long and uh, 
we, we separated longer, short segments, still NMT preference uh, that was, was the strongest for all. Looking for ratings of fluency, so where, for uh, particularly where uh, our raters rated as near native or native, we can see that there's a preference for NMT for all language pairs here as well. But the, the situation became more complicated when looking at adequacy of the MT output. So we asked the question, how much of the meaning expressed in the source fragment appears in the translation fragment? Um, and for people who answered most of it or none of it, we, so, we see that there's a, a stronger result for SMT in English German. For English Greek, it's roughly the same. And then a slight preference for NMT for Portuguese and Russian. So some examples. Um, I'm just making sure that I understand this correctly, was translated uh, in SMT and NMT. The SMT system uh, used the word so in Portuguese, meaning just, but also alone or lonely. So it roughly means I am lonely if I understand this correctly. For the source text, would you send just 10 materials that are the most suitable? The SMT output leaves out, uh, out the infinitive verb, so would you just 10 materials that are best, that are most suitable? For the NMT, schicken Sie einfach 10 Materialien, we can see that, that it's used as the, imper the imperative, but there's still a, a polite Z marker with a capital S. So our uh, evaluators considered that this was correct. It's about copy-paste from PDF to Wikicard. So the NMT output shows an example of uh, the sort of mistranslations we might see where the type of paste is actually toothpaste. <laughs> For the source text, was webinar live today? We have a human translation here. The NMT translation roughly translates as, was the webinar alive, as in not dead today? And then the SMT output is, is, has further errors. So in terms of the amount of effort put into post-editing in our evalu evaluation, we can see that there's a very slight in, uh, decrease in post-editing effort. The, produ the productivity is, is slightly higher for uh, NMT output in German, Greek, Portuguese, and Russian. But actually, the, the picture isn't quite so clear because fewer segments were changed in each of those language pairs. So for German, we can see that there were 60 unchanged segments in the SMT output, but 187 in the NMT output, which would suggest that actually, there were, while there were fewer segments changed, it took the, the um, participants longer to make those changes, and the same for the other language pairs. In terms of technical effort, so the actual number of keystrokes, there were fewer always for NMT, but uh, other than German, the difference is not so great and well within standard deviation. So there are a lot of numbers here, but basically there, uh, there were fewer overall errors for all language pairs, and there was a marked improvement in word order in neural machine translation. We can see there are more segments with no issues in uh, NMT for all language pairs. But then if we look closely, for, for Greek SMT, there were a, a smaller number of omission, addition, and mistranslation errors. For Portuguese, there were fewer numbers of omission errors in the SMT. And for Russian, there were fewer numbers of mistranslation errors in the SMT. So what we can say overall is that fluency was improved, that word order errors are fewer using neural machine translation. There were fewer segments that required editing using NMT. NMT also produces fewer morphological errors, but we found no clear improvement for omission or mistranslation errors using NMT. And in terms of NMT for dissemination, there was no great improvement in post-editing throughput or a decrease in effort. And our uh, participants said that the errors were quite difficult to spot. So the result, results were promising, but advantages weren't clear cut despite the hype. And here's another example. So when uh, Emmanuel Macron was uh, elected, um, he, uh, he, he wrote, my dear compatriots, and this was translated by Bing translators, my fellow Americans. <laughs> so depending on your training data, you might find that there's a, a little bit of bias. So when we look to teach our uh, translation studies uh, participants uh, about NMT, it, it, we, we knew there'd be difficulties because NMT is sometimes unpredictable. It's difficult, difficult to explain, to conceptualize. So I tried to build an, a, 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 a test for them where they could learn to what, what to expect from NMT by doing, to get experience of post-editing and introduction, introduction to the concept of post-editing effort, and get some experience of translation evaluation. And we've been teaching 
um, translators about MT for some time. Our, uh, as I discovered this morning, our Masters in Translation Studies program hasn't been running nearly as long as the University of Warsaw, just since 1992, so we're relative novices. Um, but our reason to involve technology is that we want translators to maintain a high level of productivity, to be able to offer value-added services, to build an evaluative awareness of cutting-edge translation technology, to maybe expand their skill sets and take on new roles, to empower them as an agent present throughout a post-editing and MT workflow, rather than taking a limited or reductive role at the very end of that workflow, and to avoid the perception that technology gets precedence and that it's inevitable. So in, in this task, I had taught them a little bit previously about machine translation, the history of machine translation, but they hadn't learned anything about SMT or NMT within our classroom. So there was a preamble and, uh, to this, uh, the evaluation I asked them to do uh, within a test environment where they were, um, they were to, uh, they were there was a small explanation of SMT and NMT and they were told they'll compare them uh, the two different paradigms using um, the evaluation methods of post-editing effort, adequacy, and error typologies. They were asked to choose 20 segments from Wikipedia, in whatever um, type of topic they, they would like. In a supported language, we used um, Microsoft Bing Translate, aiming for two groups of 10 segments of roughly equal length. I explained post-editing effort, operationalized adequacy. We used the same question as in the Tremug study and a simple error typology where there were word order errors, mistranslations, omissions, and additions. They were asked to provide a short report of up to 500 words stating a preference for an MT system, explaining their reasons using examples. So I, I carried this out first of all with second year undergraduate translation students, and then I carried it out again with a group in the Autonomous University of Barcelona where I was teaching a, a PhD summer school just to see if it would work with a different group with more experience. Um, but both co cohorts uh, had a 93% preference for NMT. The language pairs were slightly um, more um, exotic from our perspective in the second cohort. But both had a pre preference with regard to adequacy for NMT output. They found fewer overall errors for NMT, um, and fewer of each of the categories of errors. Although we can see at the bottom mistranslations in NMT, there were still 6.78 mistranslations for, uh, per every, for every 10 segments. SMT, roughly one um, mistranslation per segment. So in feedback from the students, they said it was easier to spot mistakes in SMT, but easier to correct the errors in the NMT. So the NMT errors were fewer, but harder to spot at times. And interestingly, two of our students noted that NMT had produced neologisms in their target languages in Spanish and Turkish. So they found words, and they could understand what those words meant, but they didn't know if they were actually words. So they, so they looked them up in dictionaries, and they weren't words. So these were compound words that were created by this byte pair encoding technique of splitting up the training data into, into chunks. So there were, there were comprehensible compound words that didn't exist in dictionaries. The students did very well in the evaluation. They engaged well with the exercise. They crafted reports that demonstrated an excellent understanding of the strengths and weaknesses of NMT output. They didn't consider it an immediate threat to translators, whereas in class previously they had they'd occasionally had comments where they said that you know, we might be out of a job in a few years. So this tried, seemed to assuage their fears a little bit. Although they were concerned that improvements in MT quality over time might make it an attractive option in some scenarios. We had an interesting follow-on discussion of risk, the risk of using MT, the appropriate uses of MT, ethics of retraining uh, translations for machine translation, uh, other, other uh, 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 machine learning efforts, research design, because of course this wasn't a controlled study. So the nature of Wikipedia articles is that they start general and become more specific. And most of our participants um, used, went, went with SMT first and then NMT. Um, and so the complication is that, you know, we've got more specific, more complicated language maybe being used in the second set of 10 segments. But also, as they're post-editing, they're becoming used to post-editing. They've never done it before and they're starting and, start, and they, they begin to get more, more speedy as they move along. But the idea being that rather than fearing the incoming, incoming technology, that the hope is that they'll be empowered to discuss the relative merits and drawbacks of uh, NMT from their own personal experience. And they felt positive about the technology, and they said they'd all be interested in working with NMT in future. 
So whereas with SMT post-editing, there was generally um, productivity increases found. There were all, uh, almost all of the, the research outputs showed that there were productivity increases for SMT post-editing. Common Sense Advisory estimated as of a couple of years ago that the post-editing market was worth about $1 billion annually. But there's still a question mark about how users will work with NMT. There's been no studies published of um, NMT post-editing. The LILT uh, interactive machine translation interface has moved to NMT but hasn't published anything. Uh, Modern MT, which is the, the FPK project run by Marcelo Federico, one of the, the uh, people who were behind the Moses SMT service. That's moved to NMT as of November of last year, but they haven't published anything based on uh, effort or throughput or post-editing. So to try and uh, look into this, we've uh, put out a call for papers. And if this is anything you, that you're interested in working in, there isn't much time, but uh, by June 15th, we're looking for, for papers um, to do with human factors in neural machine translation to do with post-editing techniques and approaches specific to NMT, usability studies, interactive NMT, controlled languages in NMT, and hopefully we'll find out a little bit more about how users work with neural machine translation. Um, and whereas the, the orthodoxy previously had been that MT was to be used for highly perishable texts only, such as user-generated content, maybe post-editing data, or post-editing used for a specialized text, we're finding that more and more the combination of improved MT um, quality expectations and financial pressures are pushing MT into action in other use cases. So Dag Schmidtke from Microsoft presented in 2016 at AMTA about using raw and post-edited MT for online Microsoft support. We've got a project that he's running with Anna Gerberoff and myself in DCU, looking at uh, using MT for user interface translation. We have another um, targeted project at the moment on automatic post-editing of M SMT output using a neural system trying to increase and tweak the output. There's been projects on MT for subtitling, patent translation, a project on MT for literary texts, which isn't so much an attempt to try and translate books per se, but more to try and use literary translation as a barometer of how far AI translation has come. So uh, I'm just going to leave you with a couple of open research questions that we're currently thinking about. So in terms of translation and risk, what are the potential harms of MT? And to turn that on its head, what would happen if we, if the, if we left this to the machines? and didn't use translators at all, what would the potential risks be? And I, I suspect there, the risks are quite many. To do with copyright and reuse, there was the, the Bird and Bird report from 2014 that highlighted uh, many different areas where translators could reasonably claim copyright depending on their employment conditions and their jurisdiction as creators of derivative work or creators of, of databases such as MT systems. But in general, they're disregarded within the industry. But uh, if more and more work is being repurposed, should there be royalties and who should they accrue to? And that's a general question for uh, machine learning as knowledge work is being translated into working knowledge. Um, are fewer students studying translation due to a fear of automation? Certainly it's, it's something that our current uh, cohorts of students are thinking about and are people leaving the industry? Um, if they're leaving the industry, is it due to unuser friendly um, interfaces or unuser friendly uh, work processes? And can MT developers focus on translation or MT for dissemination in an attempt to make NMT post editing a more user friendly task? And that's something that I'm putting to our MT developers within the university. But I will leave it at that for now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this excellent and very comprehensive overview of uh, various issues connected with, uh, with machine translation. Uh, we have time for one, two questions, uh, comments. Carolina Stefaniak. Mm -hmm.
limitations anymore. So that uh, it is uh, shown as something different because the post addition of maybe in future in the neural machine translation is going to be a different task that we think it is now. It's going to be maybe more like the revision of a normal human translation. Do you have any thoughts on that? The, well, there have been various suggestions to change the term of post editing because it had negative connotations, but it was still the same task, so it felt like, you know, there is was it, attempt is to it hide the same it. task? But also, that, that, my well, question, that, that is really. a, an open question for NMT, but we, we don't really, th there's no established way that users work with NMT, and it may turn out that working within an interactive translation, uh, er, machine translation interface might actually be preferable to, to, um, to wor you know, working with just post-editing of something that's been batch translated. Um, so that, that's still open to question. Um, we, ha we do have one uh, Marie Curie fellow in, in TCU who argues that post-editing isn't translation or that, you know, that a different term should be used, but uh, I'm not sure he's come to any fixed conclusion about that right now. We're, we're also doing some work to try and make whatever it is that you edit <laughs> machine translation, whether it's post-editing or otherwise, slightly less painful. So we're, we've, we've built an interface that incorporates sort of site translation using machine translation as a suge suggestion. And whereas in, rather than just using uh, keyboard and mouse, there's the possibility of using voice, which is, is increasingly common, but also using touch. So that, that was, there was a particular problem for SMT with a lot of um, word order errors. So we built a, a touch interface so that you could change the word order. Um, so it isn't, it isn't quite as much of a problem with NMT output, but it's, it still feels like the, the interfaces that translators have to work within are a couple of uh, generations behind the, you know, the state of the art interfaces for, for other types of technology. So whatever we call it, I still think that there's, there are improvements to be made in terms of usability and in making it a slightly more friendly task. Um, that's a roundabout say, way of saying I don't really know the answer to your question. <laughs> but. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have to move to the next talk. Thank you so much, Joss. Uh, we'll move for any further discussions to the coffee break. And now, as announced, I would like to uh, ask Mark Shuttleworth. who uh, has been involved in translation studies research and teaching since 1993, first at the University of Leeds, then uh, at the Imperial College London, and now at University College London. His publications include the Dictionary of Translation Studies, as well as articles on metaphor in translation, Wikipedia translation, translation technology, translated training, and medical translation. His monograph, Studying Scientific Metaphor in Translation, was published in uh, 2017, and he is also currently working on a second edition of the dictionary. And one interesting fact about him is that he speaks some Polish. <laughs> Dziękuję bardzo. Chciałbym podziękować a pani doktorka Łucebel i jej kolegów za miłe zaproszenie. Bardzo się cieszę, że, że mam tą okazję, a, możliwość być tutaj w Warszawie. A ostatni raz, kiedy byłem w Warszawie, był, było 84 rok. A widzę, że troszeczkę się zmieniła. A nawet a, Pałac Kultury teraz wygląda a, pięknie, a, a, stosunkowo mówiąc oczywiście. So thank you very much for your kind invitation. I won't torment you with my halting Polish uh, anymore, but hopefully I'll have a little bit of a chance to practice over the next day or two. I'm a bit out of practice. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, translation technology training, which is something I've been involved in for a bit of time. And I'm, I'm going to present to you uh, a, a kind of the, the, the way that I've been developing um, over the years, uh, what, I, what I include um, and why. And it's, it's probably just one, one possible way of, of teaching this um, very um, important uh, area.
So uh, I guess this was my first uh, contact with the concept of translation technology, that and the Star Trek Universal Translator that probably predated it. This comes from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Of course, it's not translation technology so much as translation biotechnology. Um, I, will, I will return to it um, very briefly uh, at the end, and you'll see possibly why I, I've included it now. But for, now, this, is, this was the state of the art when I started teaching translation technology. I don't know if anyone else here remembers the IBM Translation Manager. Um, translation Mangler, it used to be referred to, I, I, I seem to think. But, uh, but it was... Uh, it, it looks a bit um, simple now, of course, looking back on the, you know, the, the way the, the uh, interface looks uh, after a space of 22 years. Um, but it, it did what it said on the box. It was one of the first two TM tools, uh, that and uh, uh, Trados, I think. They basically hit the market at about the same time. Deja Vu, of course, is another of the early ones. Um, it looked a bit cheap and, cheap and cheerful, but it basically did the job. Um, uh, and you have a, a fairly, um, a fairly a transparent uh, interface with the translation at the top, going on at the top, and then you have the translation memory, and then you have hits from the terminology database right at the bottom. Um, in, in many ways, although the, the modern tools look um, rather different, what they do is basically the same. Um, so although that's not really used these days, it, it's, still, it's still the same technology, I guess. So um, this is the uh, kind of thing that we're now including, um, Canton MT. Uh, Joss, I don't think you mentioned this one. You, you mentioned quite a number. But this, this is a, um, a, a system that uh, allows you to develop your own SMT system from um, content that you might have created yourself or downloaded from somewhere. And that, that's one of the things that we now include in our, in our training. And more recently, you mentioned uh, uh, um, LILT, of course. Um, we, we, we would try and include um, LILT, which is an interactive, adaptive um, MT system. And the idea of that, it learns and updates itself um, in real time. Uh, so it, in fact, adapts its translation um, as, as you translate. And there's a little uh, animation here from, from their website. Perhaps it gives you a little idea as to uh, how, how it works. So it's... Uh, there we are. So as the translation gets typed at the top, the suggestions uh, that the system makes um, also get updated. Okay. Of course, we don't teach translation technology in isolation. It fits into a, um, a, a broader um, scheme. Um, this is, um, I think it's the latest version of the uh, set of competencies from the um, European Masters in Translation Network. Uh, it's now suggested as one of the main five um, competencies, translation, uh, oh, this technology, the third one down there, uh, alongside uh, other, what are viewed, uh, four other points that are viewed to be uh, essential parts of um, translation training. Um, this, of course, is training for future translators, but not only translators. We mustn't forget that many of our graduates don't actually become translators. Well, some of them go off to be bankers, of course, but that's a different story. Uh, but within, within, the, uh, within the industry, um, people take on other roles, such as project managers, uh, translation technology experts, terminologists, and so on. So they, they also need to be accommodated um, and uh, given them some preparation. Okay, so the, I've, I've called this a possible blueprint. It's, it's just the way that I, I've developed over the years. It's by no means the only way of, of, um, uh, of teaching this um, subject, but it's a way that I've found has, has worked quite well, and it covers a, a reasonable um, amount of material, I find. It, it's just a huge subject. You can't cover as much as you want to. Uh, you have to make choices, inevitably. But uh, as I said, I, I find this covers a certain number 
of, of bases. Um, so th these, the, these were the modules. They were taught in that form between 2014 and 2017. Um, at UCL, we have, uh, well, actually, we have two uh, master's uh, courses. Uh, but this was, um, these modules were designed for the MA in translation theory and practice. And of the two master's courses, this was much more literary. Um, uh, and for that reason, uh, it, it was uh, offered on, on a, an optional basis. Um, or the, the two modules were, uh, anyway. And... Um, uh, our groups were mixed language, uh, which uh, a mixed language direction as well, which explains some of the decisions that we made in, in terms of uh, what to include and how to, how to teach it. Um, the modules were taught through a weekly two-hour hands-on session, um, but that did include some um, lecturing as well, not on a weekly basis. And I guess. I would say, ideally, you need more than two hours a week. You possibly need a separate one-hour um, lecture and then uh, a two-hour practical session. I find practical sessions of less than two hours are pretty useless, really. You need to get everyone together in one room for, for um, a, a sizable chunk of time um, in, in order to be able to do something um, of value, I find. Okay, so these were, the, um, these were the aims of the modules to prepare students for various roles um, in the translation industry uh, and to equip them um, basically for all kinds of translation technology, as many as possible anyway, and um, help them to the extent that it was possible to anticipate um, future developments. Um, I try, I've always tried not to make my course solely um, a practical, uh, I like it to be uh, a, a theoretical uh, component as well. I think it's important for uh, university graduates not just to be um, able to use software, but to understand and contextualize it in a, in a the theoretical framework. Um, in brief, the two modules contained the following um, major components uh, in approximately that order. We always ha have started with um, terminology work. And then we've moved on uh, to the first uh, translation memory tool quite quickly. Um, for a long time, we didn't cover a lot of machine translation, but now you can't avoid machine translation, obviously. It's a major um, component uh, in the, um, uh, the diff diff different types of translation um, technology that are now available. Um, we also show students how to acquire their own parallel text, because I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, when you start working with uh, your first translation memory tool, you, you essentially have an empty box. And you, you end up being told how it will work once you have content. Uh, and uh, of course, as you translate, you acquire content. And as teachers, you can try and doctor your texts or choose your text carefully to ensure that it contains a reasonable amount of repetition so that the students will see that uh, it does work and it is useful. But if you show them how to download 100,000 segments from somewhere, they suddenly get a large um, amount of data that they can consult and, and um, exploit. Um, we then go on to... Um, giving them some practice building their own SMT system. That's using Canton MT, which I mentioned a minute ago. And then there's also a component of, of tool and system evaluation. Um, other things we try to, to um, cover along the way, use of Office. Um, that's largely taken for granted, but not everybody um, is uh, up to speed with Excel. And I would say that Excel, for example, is an essential um, tool. Um, for, for somebody working in the translation industry. Working with PDFs, let's face it, a lot of work gets sent to translators in PDF form. So what do you do with a PDF? Uh, how, how do you um, make it machine readable if, if it isn't already machine readable? And so on. Working with a range of different text types, converting between text types. Um, the use of TMX, uh, we, cover, we cover TMX, uh, specifically translation memory exchange format. Um, 
And um, in addition, uh, the wish list, what I would like to include in such a course, um, if there were more time, I cover three tools, possibly a fourth one. And if I were to cover a fourth TM tool, it would be one of the very, very contemporary ones, such as MateCat. What to do with the Mac. I still don't know what to do with the Mac, by the way. Um, if anyone has any suggestions, um, I would be very interested to have that discussion. Um, our, our students bring their, um, their laptops with them, and about half have um, MacBooks now. Um, but the, the, the major systems are still not uh, available in, 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 in the appropriate format. Uh, I find it a little bit of um, background on XML is useful at the moment. There's no time, there's no space in the, in the module, but that would be um, something that would be useful to include, as well as um, um, more practice in ex exploiting the, the content of corpora that you've gradually developed or, or downloaded or whatever. Okay, so um, we can't put on a course such as the one we, we do at Mount without um, input from the industry. So we have a number of um, industry partners uh, to whom we're very grateful for their um, in input and support. M many of them do um, provide their systems uh, free of charge, for which we're, we're particularly grateful. Um, uh, and of course we have, and I beg your pardon, I'm getting ahead of myself, uh, we try to maintain friendly uh, relations with, with other um, providers. Uh, it is in fact possible to mount a course like this uh, with, with, with simply the use of um, free systems or demo systems. There's, there's, one, there's one provider that does always charge um, and it's generally thought to be necessary to include the software from that provider but um, uh, apart from them uh, we, we, we find that um, the software is, is generally made available um, free, free of charge, which is which is excellent. So the soft, the, the um, how do the modules work? Um, we like to try and present the realities to the extent we're able to do that. The realities of um, working in the profession. Uh, a little bit later on, I'll show you one of the ways in which we do that. Um, we show them, hopefully, how the software can be used to improve, improve the speed and accuracy um, of the work. Our, our um, approach is that of learning by doing, um, task-based, problem-based. Um, so we, that, that shows them the practical need um, of what they're doing as they're doing it, hopefully. Uh, so it's not just a question of you press this button to do that and the other button to do this, but uh, we, we try to contextualize it. Why are you doing this? Uh, what's the point? Why are you doing it that way? What are the other ways of doing it? And so on. I've mentioned already, uh, we stress um, theory as well as practice. I, I guess our, our um, training tends to have been about 75 or 80 percent practical, uh, simply for the reasons of you know, time constraints, um, but the theory component is definitely there. So the use of software for practical translation tasks, we um, get our students to collaborate um, informally or in one case much more formally, and I'll be coming on to that shortly. Um, Learning is task-based, as I said, and it's prob based on um, problem-solving, too. Finally, um, over the years, I've liked to try and uh, collaborate with other people within the institution, which means that if, if there's a, uh, a, 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 a body uh, in, the, in the university which needs uh, some translation doing, um, we've got our students to do that as part of a project. Uh, UCL actually has three um, museums of its own. And um, for a couple of years, I collaborated with, with one of the museums. And I'll show you um, how, how that formed a collaborative translation project a little bit later on. One of the problems um, to be faced always is the question of the uh, range of abilities. Some people are t in the group are totally on the ball and really quick at picking things up. 
uh, other people take a little bit more time to become familiar with what are new concepts and new, new ideas. The idea of MT doesn't need to be explained. Um, that of TM does. Uh, I've mentioned the um, problem of, of small translation memories, and I've, I, I've mentioned, and I will show you briefly a little bit later on how we, we try to solve that problem. Uh, one, one problem that we have at UCL, because of the mixed nature of the groups and the fact that some are working into English and some out of English, um, what are the um, implications for that situation on the courseware you produce? It's uh, a always a, a little bit of a problem. It ends up usually by saying, would you mind translating out of your native language for this session um, and don't worry about the quality? Uh, I'm not quite sure what message our students get when we say that, but uh, I, I found it a little bit difficult to avoid that approach entirely. I guess if you have a more um, monolingual group or, or unidirectional group, it becomes less of a problem. So yes, the, the, the difference between translation memory and machine translation, uh, the, the idea of TM is a little bit less uh, intuitive, I think, so it has to be... Um, got used to by our students. And the, the old problem of not too, too much to do and too little time. Um, one always has to make difficult choices um, as regards what to include and what not, what not to include. So as I said, we kick off our course um, with uh, two or three sessions on um, terminology acquisition. And this has uh, two parts to it. First of all, locating and exploiting existing resources, so um, EU resources, UN resources, and so on. Um, searching for and downloading relevant glossaries. Um, that screenshot is um, from a site called lexical.com. It allows you to search for um, glossaries per language pair or per subject. We show them prompts as well as an example of a translation um, forum and how, how you can use PROS to um, perform translation queries or, or to find, find resources. Also, we spend some time uh, on um, tricks uh, and shortcuts for finding uh, solutions to specific translation problems using Google. We, we also, of course, uh, as we cover the different uh, TM tools, uh, we, we show them the, the, the uh, terminology uh, utilities. Later on in the modules, we return to terminology and we look at the question of term extraction. And uh, term extraction is a technology that allows you to um, produce a list semi-automatically of candidate terms um, from a, a corpus of texts. So the example here uh, is of terms used to refer or to, to talk about Wikipedia. And this was produced in, in a matter in a couple of minutes by uh, a system called Sketch Engine. Uh, and and you, can, you can do enough with the demo version of Sketch Engine uh, to um, enable you to show this to students. I, actually, Sketch Engine is now available free of charge within the EU. Uh, I, I think that, that's a fairly recent development uh, within institutions in the EU. Um, so uh, that, that's a very uh, welcome development, obviously. Um, bi bilingual extraction is a bit more complicated. Uh, and, it's, uh, and it's a technology that's not so widely available. So um, uh, we don't cover that so much. We tend to focus on monolingual extraction and then um, get students to find the um, equivalents, the terms that they've extracted. TM technology uh, is, has been around in terms of working systems from the early 90s at least. Uh, that is a list of as many uh, tools as I was able to find, um, certainly 30 of them. Some of them are a little known and a little used. Um, there are a number of tools which are used much more widely. We don't have time to cover them all, but we do make 
um, what, we can, what we hope is a reasonable selection from them. Now, um, the, the fact is that uh, all TM tools have a, basically the same uh, functionality, although they have different ways of um, uh, solving the same problem, maybe. Um, by the end of our modules, we try to make sure that our students are competent in the use of three of them. And up to now, um, those three in this order have been uh, WordFast Anywhere, MemoQ, and SDL Translation, uh, I beg your pardon, SDL Trava Studio. Um, apart from giving them specific experience with different tools, we hope that that approach will also enable them to pick up further tools quickly and easily, or more quickly and more easily than would otherwise be the case. Um, mo moving on to machine translation, I dare say some of you saw this, this joke which came up a couple of years ago. Apparently it actually happened uh, that the Ukrainian uh, Rosyska Federatsia was translated by Google, um, translate as Mordor. Uh, this was very quickly tweaked, and it's, unfo it's unfortunately impossible to replicate. Um, but apparently that's, that's something that happened. So what, what do we cover in our sessions on machine translation? Well, inevitably, Google Translate. Everybody already is familiar with it. They think they know how, how it works, and of course they can use it. Um, but just paste the copying and pasting text uh, and uh, into the system and then copying and pasting the translation out is a very basic way of using um, machine translation. Um, Google now has a paid-for service, uh, and if you're wanting to, to link up Google Translate with your TM tool, you have to have an, a user ID. Uh, that's been the case for a number of years now. Um, but we, we do show them that the way to, to hook up um, MT with TM, which is one of the ways in, in which it can be. Um, most conveniently exploited um, in the context of professional translation. We, we do, of course, um, cover um, post-editing, and we look at a number of different uh, interfaces. We do cover the um, Google Translator Toolkit. That's a, a fairly easy, natural way into the whole question of, of post-editing, uh, I find. We do explain uh, about how machine or statistical machine translation works uh, as well in a theoretical basis. Um, we, we, we will also start doing that shortly with um, NMT. Uh, I mentioned that we um, spend a bit of time showing students how to uh, find their own parallel text. One of the ways you can do this is using um, My Memory, uh, and you can you can specify a, a particular type of content that you're looking for, and it will assemble for you a, a modestly sized piece of translation memory which you can download. But for us, we find the most significant uh, resource is the uh, Opus website. Um, seems to be hosted, um, well, it has a UR, uh, um, an EU URL now. It's run by an academic in Sweden. You specify the language pair, and the, uh, the, you can specify subject area as well, and it, it shows you what is available for download. And as you see, the, the size of um, the resources available can be quite considerable, uh, numbered in the hundreds of thousands or even the millions of segments. So these can be downloaded and imported into a TM tool or used in the Cantan MT project that I will uh, get onto shortly. We spend a session on um, MT evaluation as well. Um, we show them several different approaches to human-based evaluation and also the concept of um, automatic measures. Uh, in, in this context, we focus um, on, on the blue metric uh, once again, that, that is, um, that, that's useful um, when, when they come to, to use Canton MT. So I mentioned about collaborating within UCL, and this is the way I did it for a couple of years. Um, 
One of UCL's um, museums is the, the Grant Museum of, of Zoology. Um, we're quite lucky, I guess, in having, having three museums, um, basically, um, on campus. It's a reasonably sized uh, selection. If you ever find yourselves in Bloomsbury, do pop in. It's quite interesting. It has, uh, actually has some dodo bones, uh, which are uh, quite a rarity, uh, I believe. Um, they, they have had this um, introductory sheet, the top 10 objects. Uh, if you just have time to whisk around in 10 minutes, you, 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 you go for the top 10 objects. Uh, the, sh the dodo bone should be there. I think they're there on the, on the left somewhere, halfway down. So um, our, our um, translation project has it involved producing translations of the top 10 objects and also some of the supplementary um, material in a number of different languages. And for this, the, the group has been split up into teams. Um, that depends uh, how it's split up and the size of the, the groups has always depended on the, the, the combinations of languages available. But each, each, thank you, um, each um, person is given uh, a, uh, a role, terminologist, uh, translator, project manager, and so on. And they have to do that translation within a very strict deadline. Uh, and then they, they write up um, their, their reports uh, as um, part, of the, uh, part of an assessment. So these are a couple of the uh, outputs. Um, th these were uploaded onto the website. The website has been revised now, so they're not so easy to find. Uh, but they, they were actually used um, by, by the Grant Museum uh, briefly. I've, I've got a few comments. I'll just go through these very quickly um, from the, the, the feedback that our... Um, Project managers produced uh, for us on the project. Generally, quite um, positive and quite interesting uh, to see what they have to say. It seems to be um, a, a quite a learning experience for them on a number of levels. Okay, so the Camtown MT project. What we asked them to do was to choose a particular subject area. Of course, MT works better if it's focused, so we, we told them to choose a, as narrow an area as possible and select a, a test text. They then logged into the system um, and they chose a, a stock engine, which is like a, a, a data starter pack um, in, in their particular language pair. And then they had to try and improve their blue score by uploading uh, terminology, uh, monolingual data, and bilingual aligned data. Uh, and the, the irritating, frustrating thing they found is that by uploading data, it didn't always improve the score. Sometimes it made the score fall. Um, so they had to get to terms with that and, and see, see how, how, how good a, they were. They weren't assessed on their final uh, blue score, but obviously they were, they were aiming to, to get it as good as possible. And at 72%, I think that was the best um, anyone came up with. Um, they took it very seriously. Uh, they had several weeks to do this. You'll see that some people uploaded vast amounts of data. Okay. Uh, and uh, as I said, you know, in many cases, the, the results were very pleasing. Now, one thing I hadn't mentioned, um, a couple of years ago, we, we were able to include, because we had some uh, basic funding, we were able to include a, uh, another um, project, which was uh, to design um, a mobile app. Uh, unfortunately, this remains uh, a virtual app um, because it still hasn't been... Um, um, realized, but I'm, I'm hoping for more funding at some point to, to uh, make that possible. So uh, a, a, an app that will allow you to search for glossaries um, on, online. Um, it is available, uh, information about it is available um, on, on the web if you're interested, but um, once again, as I said, I haven't been able to finalize it, um, unfortunately. Uh, that, that is uh, what we hope it will look like. 
um, at some point. And it's involved the team in a range of different activities. Um, so a bit of research, a bit of um, uh, collaborative writing online and blogging, um, coming up with uh, uh, ideas as a group as a whole. Uh, and just considering um, software design issues, this was a first for nearly all of them, I think, and they, they found it quite interesting and, and quite useful. So that's, that, that's, once again, what we hope it's going to look like. Okay, so big question. Have we managed to keep pace with reality? Well, we... Um, th throughout the time I've been involved in this, which is more than 20 years, we, we have kept, I think rightly, the, the focus on TM. Um, although um, we, we, our courses now are a lot broader than perhaps they were um, when, we, when we started. Uh, our students um, will know how to create their own TM content and also how to capture content from the web. Uh, they absorb um, a wide range of, of technologies. We try to impart um, a flexible approach to uh, the learning of and the use of translation technology. Uh, and we hope we give them the confidence to uh, pick up new tools um, in the minimum uh, possible time. And also importantly to know what the limitations are of the technology and when perhaps it's... Um, not appropriate um, to, to use it. I think that's still quite important. Uh, this is a selection of um, where some of our students have gone. I think this list is interesting, if for no other reason than to see that actually the Prime Minister's office in the UK really does have a translator, at least one. One might be surprised at that, but apparently, apparently they do. So I mentioned the baby fish right at the beginning. Um, they say that it's now been realized. I believe this still hasn't been uh, released. Uh, it's been in development for about uh, two years now, the, um, the, the pilot, and it fits in the ear, and apparently it allows you to have a conversation with someone else in another language. If you want to Google it, you can, there's no time to play this clip, but there's a, it's very much a promotion video. You don't actually get to know how well it works, but apparently it does work to some extent. And it's quite quite an entertaining, quite an entertaining yes. clip. You've got a couple of minutes to watch. But anyway, that's uh, that's just about it. Jenkuri Barzo, Achu, perhaps I should also say. I think we have some people from uh, Lithuania here present as well. So, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark, for uh, showing us how you apply technology to translator training. Any questions, comments? Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the present ban is for theory as well. So what exactly do you teach in the theory component of your course? Um, as and when I consider it necessary, I include a brief lecture. So I, I, I will give um, a, a general background to the area of translation technology, for example. Um, I, I do include quite a, quite a sort of serious lecture on statistical machine translation. And then apart from that, week by week, I've, I've always just included a, a more informal explanations as to you know, what, what the technology is, how it works, and why. But... Uh, but I would, I would say in terms of formal lectures over the 20 weeks, um, the way I've, I've run it, um, m maybe no more than, say, three uh, actual full-blooded lectures. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. I guess we can move to a well-deserved coffee break. But before that, I have a few announcements. Uh, after the coffee break, we will have a talk by Dr. Lucas Nunez Vera, who has just arrived, <laughs> despite the French problems. <laughs> and um, next we will have a five-minute break and we'll uh, split uh, the conference into sessions. One session will be held here 